This is a 10 pence CPU. That's 0.1 pounds. And that is a 10 pound CPU. I want to know how terrible a 10p CPU is and how much more performance you get by spending a hundred times more money. Let's meet the contenders, shall we? Uh, our budget option, oh, I mean, let's face it, both of these are incredibly budget options, but the, the most budget option possible, that is an Intel i3-4150. This is a decade-old CPU, a Haswell part that was $117 new, but a decade later it's just 10 pence at CEX. It's sporting just two cores, although it does feature hyper-threading for four total threads and runs at 3.5 GHz with a 54 watt TDP. The comparably premium chip is an i5-4690K, a Devil's Canyon CPU, which is actually a slightly older part, despite being a refresh of the fourth generation chips. I know, because Intel invited me to their offices to show me those chips when they were new. God, that was a long time ago. I've been doing this for nearly 13 years now. Anyway, this is a quad-core without hyper-threading that boosts to 3.9 GHz with an 88 watt TDP and an original price tag of $243. Nowadays though, it's readily available for just $10 at CEX. Depreciation stings, doesn't it? Now, I could stick a RX 7900 XTX in here and see just how bottlenecked it'd be, and I get that that would be funny, and hey, if you want to see that happen, maybe let me know in the comments, and maybe I'll make it happen at some point. But for this one, I wanted to go for what I think is a pretty realistic GPU choice for someone who might be spending literal pennies on a CPU. I opted for an RTX 2060, as they can be had for under £100, but are still actually good enough for gaming at decent frame rates. I've opted for 16 gigs of RAM in here in this MSI Z97M80X board, which amazingly does actually have an M.2 slot that I can use to boot from with relative ease. Amazing, I know. I'm even using a PCI Gen 4x4 drive in there, although it's not running at full speed at all. It can run at PCI Gen 3 though, which is also kind of a surprise considering how old these things are. Right off the bat though, this presents one of the biggest problems with these aging and frankly underpowered by modern standards CPUs. Loading games, even from that NVMe SSD, was a painfully slow experience. Maybe loading from a SATA SSD might have actually been a touch better, but my experience with using both of these was enough to drive me mad. Loading Shadow of the Tomb Raider, uh, this is the built-in benchmark, legitimately took five minutes just to load it, and the, you know a bunch of other games took ages as well. That's already a black mark for both of these. Now luckily I managed to preserve just enough sanity to run a handful of games at 1080p on low to medium settings on both chips, so let's take a look. Starting with CS2, there is already quite the performance difference here. The 4690K is offering 48% more performance over the 4150. That's 76.8 FPS versus 113.9 FPS. That is substantial. It's practically, you know, 60 Hz versus 120 Hz, which makes a pretty massive difference to the smoothness in game. Interestingly though, the 1% lows are only around 15% faster, although seeing this, this is CS, that's actually not that much of a surprise. Interestingly, Rainbow Six Siege is actually much, much closer. The 4690K is just 9% faster, 130.8 FPS versus 119.6 FPS on the 4150. That is a much more playable experience for sure. And that's actually on medium settings, so you've even got room to drop that down if you want a bit more performance too. The main downside to trying to play Siege on these CPUs, the 4150 in particular, is that especially after an update, which takes twice as long as it should by the way, it takes around 20 minutes to launch Siege, thanks to it pre-compiling shaders. That process on its own takes between 10 to 15 minutes, and that's kind of where you get stung here, not so much on the performance or the raw performance itself. Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows a more substantial difference. 
basically 40% more performance on the 4690K at 75 FPS versus 54 FPS on the 4150. That might actually still be playable, but I know I'd rather have the 4690K here. The interesting thing here, however, is the 1% lows. They're functionally identical between the two chips, which shows just how unstable they are. Even just watching the tests run, you can see that like assets are popping in and it's just a, a stuttery, horrible mess. Really, anything CPU intensive really struggles here. And as if by magic, that brings us nicely onto Hitman 3. The built-in benchmark here lets me split up the CPU and GPU data, and obviously this is the CPU data you're looking at. It's also a very CPU physics heavy test, which actually shows here just 16.6 FPS in the 4690K and an appalling 11.6 FPS from the 4150. Neither of these is a playable experience. The benchmark spent a decent amount of time completely halted, and no matter how many times I ran it, it was just terrible to watch. Clearly, Hitman is not a game series. You'll be playing on these ships, which is actually a shame because I really like it. Something I haven't benchmarked in quite a while, but actually feels pretty relevant here, is GTA V. I guess it's probably about the same age as these chips. Uh, again, using just the built-in benchmark for some consistency, that tends to lean on the CPU a fair bit too with all of the NPCs, and unsurprisingly the dual-core 4150 really struggled. Just over 38, 38.5 uh, FPS average versus over 80 FPS for the quad-core. That is 117% more performance, albeit for around 10,000% more money, but personally I, I think it's worth it here. GTA V was play a playable experience, especially on the 4690K, and, well, pretty dreadful on the 4150, so that's a win for the relatively premium chip here. And lastly, we have Cyberpunk 2077 on low settings. This isn't exactly amazing for either chip, 44 and 54 FPS for the i3 and i5 respectively, but at least I would consider the i5 somewhat playable. The 1% lows being at 30 FPS compared to just 25, uh, well, is definitely better, although still not exactly a smooth experience. Again, Cyberpunk tends to be more on the CPU heavy side, at least depending on what area of the map you're in. Downtown, where there's lots of NPCs and cars, well, that chugs. In the Badlands, where NPCs are a lot more scarce, you might have a bit more of a playable experience. On average, the 4690K is 46.5% faster than the 4150, and in a number of games is genuinely playable where the i3 just isn't. It's clear that the 4150 just isn't a worthwhile chip anymore. The dual-core design has screwed it for modern usage. The stuttering, the, the fact that actually both of them take an absolute age to load games, and the stilted and sluggish operation even just in Windows, well, kind of hurts both of their causes. I'm genuinely impressed how much performance a 10 pound CPU can offer. And yeah, a 10p CPU can, uh, actually isn't as bad as it sounds, but it's still not quite fit for purpose. And I think we need to investigate slightly higher price points to find out where the line is between a great budget find and e-waste. Subscribe if you want to see that. With that said, those are my thoughts and a look at a 10p and £10 CPU. Let me know what you'd like to see me test next in the comments and what sort of price points you think would be a good choice to look at as well. Um, otherwise, if you want to support these videos, I bought these parts myself, including the motherboard and RAM for this video. So if you want to support me, you can hit the subscribe button, turn on the bell notification icon, check out plenty of other videos and end cards, and there's a load of links in the description for hoodies and t-shirts like this one, my own hardware, the open source response time and latency testing tools at osrtt.com, and a load of other stuff. So feel free to take a look. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next video.